Dr. Gordon Lautz is Professor of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the University of Zagreb. His laboratory performed the first large-scale studies of the human plasma and human IgG glycomes. He is the founder and co-director of the Human Glycome Project. And with that, let me start the interview. Hello, Dr. Lapps, you are Professor of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the University of Zagreb and one of the leading authorities on glycosylation. So welcome to Modern Health Spine and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. So, Professor Lapps, could you introduce yourself and uh, briefly, and, and why did you choose to study glycans? And then I guess from glycans to aging, is that how it went? Yeah. So. I, I work in the field of glycobiology for 30 years now. And initially, it was just a random event. My, at the time, boss brought a new kit to test glycosylation, and it looked interesting. And it remained interesting for the last 30 years because I think this is one of the last frontiers. You know, we have immune system, we have brain, which we don't understand, and we have glycosylation, which we really don't understand how it functions. And it's essential for so many biological processes. And aging was um, kind of um, more serendipity because we were first focusing on diseases and looking at patients and controls. And then we realized if we don't perfectly match patients and controls for age, we were always seeing differences. So then we realized glycans change a lot with age. And then we developed this uh, glycan age, index of aging, and so on. And we will definitely dive into the glycan aging piece a little bit later. But could we start with a little background on glycans and glycosylation? And kind of what are they? How do they work inside the body? So I think first thing is to make a clear distinction because between glycans and glycation. So we are all familiar with the glycated hemoglobin A1C or HbA1C, which is a random damage when a glucose, which is elevated in uh, diabetes and prediabetes, reacts with the uh, amino groups and proteins and just forms this uh, uh, glycated hemoglobin, then converted to advanced glycation end products and so on. This is a random damage, which has nothing to do with the glycosylation I will be talking about. So glycosylation is a very sophisticated enzymatic process where the majority of proteins and nearly all proteins which evolved after the life became multicellular are enriched with glycans. So they're not composed only of polypeptides, so protein is a polypeptide chain. The sequence of amino acids is encoded in a gene. So gene determines the, the polypeptide backbone of all proteins. And proteins are the major effectors of everything. There are molecular robots which, which perform most of the functions from muscle contraction, from digestion, from DNA synthesis, anything. So proteins do the work. And the majority of eukaryotic proteins so the proteins of more complex organisms, not bacteria, but eukaryotic uh, organisms are glycosylated. So they're enriched in their structure and function by the addition of glycans. And this is one of the essential biological processes. So the proteins which do the work, they're not only polypeptide, they're polypeptide plus glycans. And glycans determine many roles of proteins. For example, immunoglobulins, antibodies, can be either pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. So normally we think about antibodies as pro-inflammatory because they attack the, the invaders, they attack bacteria, viruses, and then our immune system kills them. But antibodies, and actually the majority of antibodies, most of the time are acting to suppress inflammation because too much inflammation is bad. And we know that inflammation is one of the things which is driving aging at molecular level. And this decision, whether antibody will be pro or anti-inflammatory is determined by glycosylation. So by adding or even by modifying glycans and proteins on immunoglobulins, we can make them promoting inflammation or we can make them in a way to suppress inflammation. 
So the glycans are made up of a set of sugars. Is that correct? And can I, how many different sugars are there that form? Yeah, well, you know, everything in life is made of sugars. DNA has sugars inside. All the major elect, uh, energy metabolites like ATP have sugars inside. So the sugars are the first molecules of life. Cellulose is a sugar. So problem is when we say sugar, everybody thinks about the white sugar, the saccharose, which we put in coffee. So sugar carbohydrates are a set of molecules which build life on this planet. So um, there are not many building blocks, approximately 10 different monosaccharides, but they can be linked in many different ways. And the key difference between glycans and all other macromolecules is that they're not linear. They're branched structures and their information capacity is huge and both information and structural capacity. So this is why multicellular life a couple of billions of years ago invented glycosylation and started actually even Archaea invented glycosylation, but the eukaryotes started to use it for so many different functions and all the, the, all the higher level functions of uh, multicellular organisms include glycans. So there is no life without glycans. There's no single cell which can survive without glycans. Just people don't analyze glycans a lot because they're chemically complicated and this is challenging, and there are not so many laboratories which can do high throughput glycomics. So, how, how are the glyco, uh, how are the glycans regulated? So, what, what is it that decides oh, how this, this very complex thing gets put together? The, 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 this is the most difficult question. Uh, the answer is we don't know. Oh. So, what we are trying to understand how this happens. And for example, for this immunoglobulins, which I mentioned. We know that there are over 40 different genes which work together to make this decision. And some of these genes don't even operate in a B cell, so the cell which produces antibodies. It's other cells in the immune system, genes expressing, expressing these cells, talking to the T cells, and making a decision how to glycosylate the protein. For example, if we get pneumonia. It can be either bacterial or viral. So different agents can cause pneumonia. And depending on the, on the pathogen, antibodies will get a different glycosylation. So somehow our immune system can sense whether the, the same symptoms, pneumonia, is caused by virus or a bacteria, and then make antibodies which will be better in eliminating virus or a bacteria. Extremely complex process. We know very little about it. This is one of the focuses of our research. We are trying to understand how this is being regulated. So is it only proteins or do fats also get glycosylated? So Normally, we call triglycerides fats. So fat, like mm -hmm. triglyceride, does not get glycosylated. But the lipids, there are some glycosylated lipids. There are even glycosylated RNAs. Many, many other molecules can be glycosylated. So it's, uh, glycans are ubiquitously present in nature. 